Proverbs chapter 25 and verse number 11. And you're hearing and you can keep it open there if you want. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 25, verse 11, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. Apples of gold in pictures of silver. Is that what your Bible says, pictures? All my life, I thought that was talking about picture, like a picture that you, and I saw that the other day, pictures. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for this word. We pray that we can have an understanding. I pray that you open up our minds, Lord. We don't want to open our minds to just anything, but we certainly want to open up our minds to your word. When the preacher gets away from the word, we want to close our hearts and our minds. But as long as the preacher stays in the word and the spirit is moving, oh God, speak to us in Jesus' name we pray. You may be seated. A word fitly spoken. I don't know exactly what the translators, I know when we were in Bible college, we learned that the people that wrote the transcripts of the Bible originally were men that were devoted to nothing but writing. This is before the internet, before the computers and the printers. So the Bibles back in those days, the literature of those days were all handwritten. And as they were translating from, from one language to another, they would bathe themselves before they walked into a room. And in and, and the room where they were going to translate the word of God and if there was a mistake made and they caught the mistake they would take the whole page or 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 everything they had written I forget it was it was painstaking they would take and wipe it all up go take a shower clean up and then walk back into this place completely clean and start over letter by letter uh, until they completed the work that they were doing. And it would take a long time. They were not going to put up with any mistakes. And I began to wonder what the thought process is because there are words in our language, even in our two languages that are here today, from Spanish to, to English, that do not translate. There is not a word. And a lot of times people say, well, what did he say? What did he say? And somebody says something really funny in Spanish. But if you go try to say it in English, it doesn't translate and it's not funny. And we all had a, a taste of that the other day. We were at, at uh, the rock, La Roca, and uh, a preacher was preaching in English. And uh, another brother was interpreting in Spanish because the church is mainly Spanish people. And uh, there were the, the white guy, the, the English speaking guy was, well, they were both white, but one guy can speak Spanish. And, and so the English-speaking guy was preaching away, and he said, I got myself in a pickle. And the Spanish translator stopped, and, and the guy looked at him and says, why, they don't have pickles in Spanish? <laughs> they got pickles, but it does, we don't use pickles like that. So it didn't translate. So I wonder what was going on through the mind of the translator, a word fitly spoken. What in the original was the word fitly? Because we understand something has got to fit. We understand that word. If the shoe fits, the saying says, if the shoe fits, what? I got news for you. Just because the shoe fits, don't mean you have to wear it. Don't fall for that kind of stuff. It ain't the right color. It don't match. It's a girl's shoe. Don't put it on just because it fits. Well, in the first place, how would you know if it fit if you weren't trying to know? So don't do that. But it's just because a shoe fits, you don't have to wear it. But the word fitly, 
something that fits. Have you ever been talking to somebody that say something and you're like, uh, where, where, what are you talking about? You're having a conversation. We had a nephew. My wife had a nephew. He done passed away, but when he was young, all of his days, he spent watching movies. Every day at night, wee hours, just watching movie after movie, reruns, and, and he knew just about every movie, Back to the Future, verbatim. They knew when this certain line was coming, and they would say it right when the actor would say it. They, I hope nobody does that here. But you'd be talking to this young man, and he'd say a sentence, and you're like, unless you watched the movie, it didn't make any sense. It was a word that was not fitly spoken except in the mind of this young man. But when we're having a conversation, a guy, a person should talk for a little bit, and you should listen. And then if there's a little silence, um, then you say your part and continue with what was being in the conversation. I know Brother CJ doesn't do that. Brother CJ, you're talking Brother CJ, and you see a blank face in his face. He's not listening to what you're saying. He's thinking about what he's going to say as soon as he be quiet. Somebody else does the same thing. Brother Alex. And now Brother Alex and Brother CJ work together. Can you imagine that? So the writer here uses the word fitly spoken. There are times when you shouldn't say certain things. One of the things that I find a lot of Christians, so-called Christians, you're going to hell for doing that. That is not a word fitly spoken because it doesn't fit. It's not your language. It wasn't given to you to tell anyone, no matter what they're doing, that they're going to hell. What you should do is what this lady done, what that sister done. Somebody ought to prophesy. You see somebody doing something wrong? How about a word of prophecy? You might be lost today, bud, but I'm telling you, I'm praying for you. One of these days, I'm going to see you in the house of God. That's a word of prophecy. A word of prophecy is not predicting the future. This, all, all this pandemic and all this unrest this is just the beginning of sorrow, saints of God. Do you think this is bad? I was reading earlier today, this morning, about the pandemics that have been in the past. Some of them were horrendous. Horrendous. And what made it so bad is because there was no science. There was no medicine. There was nothing for humanity to turn to. When the, Ameri when the European people came to America, the Indians that were here had no immunity I think it was the smallpox. And something like 90% of the American Indians died because they had no immunity until somehow they started building the immunity. And so if you think that things are horrible right now, it's going to get a lot worse. It's going to get really bad. Now, there's a lot of preachers that are preaching that we're going to go through the Great Tribulation. And there are preachers that are saying, we're going to go through half of the Great Tribulation. And then there are preachers, and that's the part that I am, that we're going to be out of here before the Great Tribulation. I believe that God is going to spare the church like he spared Enoch. Enoch didn't have to go through the flood. Noah had to go to the flood, but he was in the ship. God protected Noah. And I believe that there is going to be some Jewish people that will go through the great tribulation, but God, they're going to turn to Christ. Yeah. They're going to realize that Christ that we serve and Jehovah of the Old Testament is one and the same. Right. That's the reason they haven't accepted Christ because they don't realize they don't have the revelation. Their eyes have been closed. They don't understand. They don't have, they don't even want to look at the New Testament. The Jewish people have been told and I heard a young man testifying that he was on a plane and he got to talking to a Christian. And he said, yeah, I said, I don't, I don't read the New Testament because my parents always has taught me that the Bible teaches you guys how to hate and how to kill Jews. 
And the Christian was a kind Christian. Began to explain to this Jewish guy. He says, we didn't write the New Testament. The Gentiles didn't write the New Testament. These were all Jewish people. Right. Except for Luke, the rest were all Jewish people. The guy says, are you sure? He said, of course I'm sure. We love the Bible. We study the Bible. We study the old and we study the new. And, I, and as I was preaching to the Spanish uh, this evening, and I began to, to understand that the English Bible says, the Lord is my shepherd. But the Spanish says, Jehovah is my shepherd. In other words, Jesus is a good shepherd, right? Because the Bible says, the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. And we know that Jesus died for us. And we are the sheep of his pasture. The Bible makes it very clear. So Jesus is definitely the good shepherd. But Psalms 23 says, Jehovah is my shepherd. I've always told you that David was just a little bit ahead of the Testaments. He was always preaching, teaching, and writing about this phenomena that one day God would live inside of humans. And so you begin to understand a revelation that if Jehovah is my shepherd, then I, I got to accept that my shepherd, Jesus, is Jehovah. It's not a new God. It's not a brand new God. The word was made flesh and he dwelt among us. John chapter 1 says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Verse 14, and the word was made flesh and he dwelt among us. Jehovah is oh, my shepherd and I shall not want. We, we are living in, in, in a dangerous time when we need to know I'm saved evermore. I'm saved evermore. Not because a preacher told me, okay, now you're saved. No, I know I'm saved because the word of God tells me I'm saved. Because the word, Jesus himself talking, said, unless you're born again of the water and of the spirit, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And so this is what has happened to the Jewish people. They rejected Christ and their eyes were blinded and they never accepted him, accepted him as the Messiah. So they have completely rejected the Christ, the Messiah, the way of salvation. Jesus said, I am the door. So they have not come through the door. And so they still hold on to their Old Testament literature. And you can read the Old Testament and find Christ in the Old Testament. And you can read the New Testament and find the God of the Old Testament in the New Testament. Everything that God claimed in the Old Testament, Jesus claimed in the New Testament. Was he lying? Remember when he, when he, when he forgave that man of the palsy, he said, thy sin be forgiven? Oh, they got mad. The Jewish people got mad. They were ready to stone him. Only God can forgive sins. Also, that you might believe that I have the power he said unto the, uh, to the, to the man of the palsy, take up thy bed and walk. And the man took up his bed and he was made whole from that moment. Why? He was trying to prove one thing. I am God manifested in the flesh. I, if I'm not God, then I have no power to forgive sins. But if I forgive sins, I'm going to prove to you that I can forgive sin because I've got the power not only to. And he said, what is easier? What would be easier? To say, your sins be forgiven, or to say, take up the bed and walk. Now, you might wonder, well, I don't know what would be easier, Pastor. Well, to heal the man, the Bible says, by his stripes we are healed, right? Amen. So all Jesus had to do to heal the man is to have the stripes upon his back. That would bring healing to humanity. By his stripes, we are healed. But if he's going to forgive sins, he's going to have to go to the cross. He's going to have to die. He's going to have to resurrect on the third day. But praise God that Jesus did exactly what he said he was going to do. He died on the cross. And he said, Father, forgive them. A word fitly spoken. 
when the fullness of time came, the Bible talks about. Many times we, talk, we see in the word of God, when the fullness of time came. And so we see God waits till it's the fullness of time. The, the, the time of the Gentiles is only two days, which is 2,000 years. A day is like a thousand years and a thousand is like a day. Two days is all that the Gentile people have been given. This two days are already over. We are living in a transition between dispensations. We are living in a, in a period in between the dispensations. Like the dispensation of the law. There was that period of time when Christ walked on the earth. And then we went into the dispensation of grace. After the day of Pentecost when the Holy Ghost fell begun the last days because the Bible had already prophesied that in the last days says the Lord I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh and it, and it was poured out on the day of Pentecost in the last days not the last day but in the last days so the last days are not over so God is still pouring out his spirit I will pour out of my spirit says the Lord upon all flesh so the last days begun on the day of Pentecost over 2,000 years ago. So we're in the transitioning. So what's going to happen next, Pastor? The Lord is coming after his bride. God is not going to put his bride through the great tribulation. We have already suffered the rejection. We've already been spit upon. We've all been ridiculed. We've got a government now that is all bent on doing the opposite of what God wants. I'm telling you what, we're not going to fall for that because right about the time they they come to put their hands on the on the people of God his bride guess what there's going to be a, a, a sound from heaven the trumpet is going to sound the dead in Christ are going to raise and then we which are alive and remain will be caught up together to meet him in the air and then from there on after the church is gone after you don't have a preacher up here preaching and there's quiet in the church after the government guess what they want they want to control why do they want to control? Why? Kamala Harris, he tried and tried and tried and tried. Oh, I want to be in control of people. He kept climbing and climbing. Oh, so you're now the first woman, the first black woman to be the vice president. And if something happened to Biden, Kamala Harris will be the president of the most powerful nation in the world. What? Got plenty of money. Got a wonderful husband, a wonderful home. But there's this drive that drives people. They want to, if you're a bossy person, anybody here bossy? Don't raise your hand. If you're bossy, that's not a good thing. Especially if you're a couple. You ought to work together. Doesn't God work that way? He don't need us. But doesn't God, he's patient with us, long-suffering. He watches over us. And he gives us free will. If you want to backslide today, you know, God is not going to strike you with a bolt of lightning. A lot of people say, we, you know, oh, I don't go to that church because they won't let you wear this. They won't let you wear this. We don't say nothing. You can wear whatever you want. But, but if you really want to please the Lord, if you want to be pleasing in his sight, because you know when God's little heart is not a nasty heart like ours, when his heart goes pitter-patter and he, he looks at you being holy, when, when you're being unholy, God's sad. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Well, we, well what is that part that says? Yeah, here, there, but there's one that says, Jesus loves me when I'm bad, though it makes him very sad. Jesus loves me when I'm good, when I do the things I should. So our God has got feelings. So when, when you're not doing very good, or when you're out doing you're not, what you're not supposed to do, it saddens him. Because if he was to come in that moment that you're in there doing something you're not supposed to, you'll be left behind. But when you're doing good, when you're in the house of the Lord on Sunday, God's heart says, wow. See, now you understand the joy 
of the Lord is my strength. When God is happy with what I'm doing, man, I got some strength. Why? Because I got that almighty God behind me. A lot of people says, well, when I jump and, and uh, jump and shout and I got the joy of the Lord inside of me, that makes me stronger. No, 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 no. They, they, they think I'm going to go to church and I'm going to jump and shout because I want to be strong. And then they go out and have a beer, go to the dance, go drink and go, go doing drugs or whatever. But I got the joy of the Lord in my heart. No, 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 no. Is the joy of the Lord. Not the joy that you try to conjure up. But when the Lord's got joy, when he, when he looks and sees the Pentecostals of Immokalee doing what they're supposed to be doing, man, he gets happy. When God is happy, guess what? You got some strength. Ask. Man, I've, I've told you this many times. When, when something's going on in church and everybody's clapping, everybody's crying, everybody's involved in the service, it's a good time to ask God, God, touch me. God, heal me. Because God is in the house. And you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. You're bringing joy to the Lord. A word fitly spoken. Now, I'm about ready to close. But I want to point something out. Right there where it says, like apples of gold. In pictures of silver. This was written nearly 2,000 years ago. And I, they didn't have pictures. Not like you and I. Pictures. How many of you remember when you took your roll of film to the drugstore and they had to develop? Remember that? And you only got, what, 23 or 24 pictures. So when you were taking pictures, you had to make it count. Now, now you got your camera please, taking pictures of everything, stupid things, good things, bad things, whatever. Pictures, pictures, pictures. Free. Take all the pictures you want. But back in the day, you bought a roll. You had to go in a dark place because the light would ruin your film. If it is, you go in a dark place, put it in the camera, close it real good, and then you thought about why you're going to take a picture. Now, a lot of you might not know this, but I heard this a while back, and I studied what was in the process of developing these pictures when you took them to the hardware, not the hardware store, when you took them to the drugstore to get them developed. And remember, remember those booths that they used to have in the mall, the little booths where you could take your Kodak and have to remember that? It's all things of the past. How many of you remember the phone booths? Yeah. I don't want to get too far out of there, but no more phone booths, no more film booths. People don't know what fun is, but I began to study what it took to develop or what was the process of developing these, these pictures. And you know what they use for developing pictures? The number one thing, silver. Now, how did David know about pictures of silver? Well, this is over 2,000 years ago. They didn't have cameras. They didn't have internet. So I, I would like to someday take time and go to a commentary and find out exactly what the Bible's talking about here. But I'm telling you what, when God gives us his word, it, it's better than just a picture. If you have faith, yeah. if you have faith, when there is room to doubt, there is also room for faith to operate. You don't need faith to say, Today, I'm sitting in the Pentecostal church. You don't need faith. It's happening right now. You're already here. You made it. You don't need faith. You don't need faith for anything that you can see. But when there's problems or when there is uncertainty, as we begin to see all these earthquakes, as we begin to see the pandemic, and now they're saying part two is coming back with a vengeance. When we see people dying of cancer, when we see the weather changing, we begin to see all these things. Our hearts almost want to stop. But I want to tell you, I want to give you a word fitly spoken today. In the middle of all of, of that uncertainty, if you have faith in Christ, it does not matter. And at any time that there's room for doubt, guess what? You can take doubt out and put faith. 
Put faith in there. God, it's going to be okay. The worst that can happen to us humanoids, if we've been born again, if you've never been born again of the water and of the spirit, I, I wouldn't want to be in your shoes right now. But to you that have been born in the of the water and of the spirit, those of you that have spoken in tongues when the Holy Ghost came, those of you that have been buried in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sins, I've got a word for you that is going to be fitly spoken that drives away all perfect love. Valentine's Day, perfect love. Past, have you accepted the love of Christ? Have you accepted it? Could you imagine me bringing a, a bouquet? Christ died. And before he died, before he went away, he said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will send the comforter. And after a while, after he, well, he was gone, after he told Terry in Jerusalem to you be endued with power from on high, they didn't know what power from on high was, but they went and they did it. And the Bible says, suddenly there came from heaven a, a sound as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. You know what, what it was? It was Christ, the Holy Ghost. And Christ are the same one. Because Jesus said, I am with you now, but I shall be in you. Now, we don't have a little man inside of us. The, Bible, the, the people that teach the Trinitarian doctrine, they say that Jesus was the, the figure of a man that walked on the earth, the son of God. But I don't have the figure of a man inside of me. What do I have? I have the Holy Ghost. And, and even the Trinitarians accept the Holy Ghost. They, they do believe that the that the Holy Ghost is in us. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. So the Holy Ghost and Jesus are the same. Now, if we can under, if we could ever get past the fact that Jesus was God, man, once you get that revelation that the, 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 the God of the Old Testament has become Jehovah, has become my salvation. How did he become my salvation? He was born of a virgin and he died on a cross. What did he do? What is the gospel? The gospel is this. The death, the burial, and the resurrection. Anybody ever ask you, what is, what is the gospel? We always hear the gospel. The gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection. That is the whole gospel. Now, how do I accept the gospel? I die by coming to repentance. Repentance is a sign of death. I'm going this way. God, I don't want to go that way anymore. Help me, forgive me, change me. And the Bible says he will forgive you of all your sins. You're forgiven, now you start walking this way. You've not yet arrived. Anybody here yet arrived? None of us yet arrived, but we're walking. And we're walking in the right direction. And when the trumpet sounds, if you're walking in the right direction, guess what? You will be caught up. But if you're not walking yet, if you're still in your own way, I'm going to go my way. God will let you walk your way. Guess what, Pastor Rios? I'll let you walk your own way. You can just go on. Nobody's going to stop you. Nobody stopped me when I was going my, my own way. Nobody stopped my dad when he was a drunken alcoholic. Jesse tried to help him. Tried to go to church. Augie, go to church, man. There's a better way. There's a better way. No, he kept, nah, man, I don't want to hear nothing about your God. He, don't talk to me about that no more. Just kept going in his own way. God never stopped him. Mom couldn't stop him. Us kids hungry at home couldn't stop him. Conviction couldn't stop him. Condemnation could not stop him until Augie himself in a jailhouse knelt down. God, if there's really a God, give me one more chance and I promise you I'll never come back here. Guess what? There is a real God and God gave him one more chance and he never went back to drink. He never went back to prison. Why? Because he accepted the gospel. He repented. Number one, death, burial, and resurrection. You repent, then you're buried. We're making a burial place over here. We're making a baptistry. That's why that's back there. Pretty soon there's going to be water running back there. And people are going to be able to say, hey, here's water. What hindereth? <laughs> Remember that guy in the desert? After, the, the, after Isaiah's writings and everything, and Philip is explaining what, what Isaiah had written. See? Isaiah's in the Old Testament, but you can find Christ in the Old Testament. And, and Philip is explained to the eunuch the gospel 
out of the Old Testament. And so they're riding in the chariot. And, and the eunuch says, well, here's water. What hindereth? And the Bible says that Philip got out and baptized the eunuch. He didn't baptize him in the title as the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. You'll never find that anywhere in the Bible. He baptized him in the lovely name of Jesus. For there is no other name given among men by the which we must be saved. Man, I, I'm all over the place today. I left the Jews stuck over there in the Old Testament. The Jews rejected the Christ because their eyes were blinded because they didn't accept Jesus as God, as their Messiah. But when the church is caught up and their eyes are open, and they, were, they will be in the middle of a uh, treaty, right in the middle, about three and a half years into a treaty that is going to accept a one world government, a one world church, and a one world economy. When you talk about economy, you're talking Jewish people. Jewish people run most of the economy of this world. They're good with money. God has blessed the Jewish people. So a lot of the banks, a lot of things, you might not know this, but they are owned and operated by Jewish people. So they bring the money. The Roman Catholic brings the church and I believe, I don't know, but I believe the United States is going to bring the government. And if you don't belong to this government, if you don't belong to this church, then you won't be able to go to, to uh, just any church. And, and this will ex include the Methodists, the Baptists, the Episcopalians, the obviously the Catholic, uh, Assemblies of God, Church of God. All these denominations believe in the Trinity. They will baptize you in the titles, Father, Son, the Holy Ghost, because they believe that God is three persons. Now, the reason the Jewish people cannot accept Christianity, because they will never believe that God is three persons, because they are taught from the very beginning, Hero Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord. And so they will not give up their religion to become a, 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 a Trinitarian. It's just, it doesn't fit in their mind. Their God is one. But they don't understand that there is an apostolic Pentecostal people that still believe that God is one, that Jesus is the one. And so when the church is caught up and that that treaty that they, they have made with Israel concerning money, world and, and religion and all of that, the, the enemy, the Antichrist is going to break the treaty. And then the Israelites' eyes will be open, and they're going to realize that this is the Antichrist, and the, the real Christ is the one that they crucified. And then hundreds and thousands of Jewish people are going to be baptized in the, in the lovely name of Jesus, accept him as Lord and Savior. There will be a second rapture. And that's why there's a lot of arguments that says, no, we're going, the church is going before, no, we're going during, and no, some post afterwards but I'm here that there's going to be more than just one rapture but the first rapture is going to be before the great tribulation so before you get all ex all scared the Bible says when you see all these things begin somebody say begin yeah. when you see all these things begin to happen are we seeing them as they begin yeah. have we seen the Antichrist yet no is he is he around I'm telling you he's around already he's already getting ready to establish his kingdom. So we are going to see the beginning of sorrows. When you see all these things begin to happen, what does the Bible say? Get scared because you're going through the great tribulation. He said, look up for your redemption, not the Jewish, not the chosen ones, not the ones that are going to be raptured, but the church. He's talking to the church to those that have been born again of the water and of the spirit, to those that have got the Holy Ghost, to those that are living a holy life, to those that are pleasing to the groom. Would you marry a woman that didn't make you happy? Women never start a fight when you're dating. They always wait till afterwards, but, but when you're dating, oh man, it's Valentine. Every day is Valentine. The bride should be that way. We should be in love with our... What do I do, Pastor? I go to the Word and find out why. what does the groom like. He lo I'm telling you what, he loves holiness. He loves it with a passion. He said, be ye holy 
as I am holy. Yeah. But I can't seem to do it, Pastor. Well, he knows you can't do it by yourself. But you know when you become holy? When you get the Holy Ghost. Yeah. So then it's, it's, it's you just, do you see anything different about me? Am I walking like two inches off the ground? But I am holy because he has made me holy. I have nothing to brag in myself. The Bible says, for all have sinned. I'm just as big a sinner as everybody else, except that I have the Holy Ghost living inside of me. And that makes me holy. You know what else makes me holy is that my sins have been washed away. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Man, I, I told you I wasn't going to preach real long. Real quick, if you have your Bibles, and we'll, we'll finish this. Oh, man, I'm excited. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy, all this shaking that is going on is shaking off all these false prophets. So everybody that prophesied that Donald Trump was going to win, false prophet. And in the first place, that's not prophesying. The Bible says, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge. And though I have all faith so that I could move, remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. Church, I hope you get it tonight. I hope you get it in your head. What I what is the essence of a Christian? Is the essence of a Christian moving mountains? Is the essence of a Christian feeding the hungry? Uh, my wife was telling me a story of a, in Bradenton uh, of, a, of a, I don't know what, you could call it a woman because it was all dressed up with a wig, lipstick, makeup, high heels, and a dress. But when he or it spoke, it was a man. And he, he was wanting $200 from the church. Yeah, I'm here from California. I need help. I need the church to give me $200. And, uh, and they said, well, we don't give out money. If you're hungry, we'll give you food. And she goes, as much as you've done it to the least of these, the Bible says, you've done it unto him. But the Bible says as much as you've done to the least of my, brother, of my brethren. If you're not a brother... And I, I told him, I said, you should have took the same scripture and given it to her or him and says, no, this is scripture for you. As much as you've done it to one of God's people, this is not a scripture for God's people to do to somebody else. Jesus was saying, as much as you've done it to one of my brothers, which are the brothers in the church, because sometimes the church is in need, sometimes one of the brothers in the church is in need, a sister in the church. And as much as you've done to help that individual, you've done it as unto the Lord. But the Lord has never asked us to take foolishly and give money to people that are, you know what they're going to do with it. If she would have saved the money she bought on the dress and the high heels and the lipstick and all that stuff, she could have had $200. But is that the essence of a Christian? To be able to feed the hungry. And as I said, though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. It's not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoices in the what? The truth. Saints of God, we got to be in love with the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, what? They shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For ye know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass 
darkly. It's like a, a, a mirror that is all sm smeared. We don't see very clearly right now because we're still in this flesh. But then we're going to see him face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now listen to this, saints of God. This is what God wants to leave a word very fitly spoken in this day when everybody's making fun of everything, making fun of presidents and dignitaries. The church should not get involved in that. The Bible says, and now abide of faith, hope, and charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. Let's stand. What are we to do in the middle of all this unrest? Have faith. And don't lose the love of God. Because iniquity shall abound, the Bible says, the love of many is going to wax cold. We don't want that to happen. Lord, we thank you today. Thank you for another day in the house of God. We want to preach the word. We want it to be fitly spoken in, in, at the right time, in the right place. This is not something we preach out there in the streets. This is not something that we preach out at work. This is something we want to preach in the church. The message today is for the church. We must not allow our love for one another, our love for humanity, our love for our God, somehow to be hid with a bunch of religiosity of, of giving and, and dressing and all that kind of stuff is good, but that is not the essence of a Christian. The essence of a Christian should be love. In this, they will know that you are my disciples and that you have love one for another. Make us that kind of a church. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen. Hey, man, we're still practicing social distance, so fellowship, but don't be kissing on anybody. Could I, could I see the board members, Sister Shaw, Brother Freddie? It's only going to take you about two minutes. Brother Freddie, Brother Raymar. I think it's all the members we got here. 